many participants? All right. Welcome, everybody, yeah. to another Hello. webinar. Yeah. Good to have you all here. Good to have you all here. We're giving a few seconds for everybody to jump in and join as uh, people start flooding in here. This is good. Good day. Good day. All right. Okay, it looks like it's slowing down. All right. Thank you all for joining us. This is our next webinar in a series. We uh, we started this last month in January talking about reimagining and reinventing benchmarking. And uh, during that webinar, we had a little bit of a background as to some of the ways you could get in context. Uh, since then, we've had a ton of conversations with folks about benchmarking and in context and what's working, what's not. How do you win that moment? So. This webinar is going to follow on, and we're going to be talking about winning that moment where people you get to use your product in real life and how that in context and uh, sensory cues are going to help inspire winning renovations. And we're going to be focusing specifically in this case on renovations. We're going to be showing some really good examples uh, as we go through today because a lot of the questions were, hey, can I see some real metrics? What are some of the ways I can get to this information to make myself number one? So looking forward to having this discussion with you today. Yep. Uh, I'm Greg Stuckey. I'm Chief Research Officer at Insights Now. And with me is yep. Dave, Dave Lundahl. Yeah, Dave Lundahl. Uh, so uh, been working with Greg for a for, uh, long, long time, over a quarter century. <laughs> uh, but anyways, we've done a lot of webinars. Um, I actually haven't been involved with a webinar for a few months. And uh, mm -hmm. I'm excited to come back and talk about uh, competitive benchmarking. Um, how do you win the, the product use moment? And for, especially when talking about renovation. So great topic. Yeah, so it, questions. This is uh, interactive. If you've got questions that you wanna ask as you uh, go through uh, the session, feel free to pop open that chat box and drop questions in there. We will try to address them as we uh, see them come up. However, we're also gonna have time at the end of the session for more Q&A. So don't be afraid to drop in your questions there. Uh, we certainly know a lot of people have a lot of questions about this particular area. All right. So one thing that we've learned uh, and working with Dave for that long, one thing I, I, I know I've learned, Dave, is that people don't buy products. They really buy an experience. They're looking for your product to provide them uh, an exciting opportunity in life to connect with your brand in some way, shape or form. Now, they may not say it that mm -hmm. way, but really, in order for us to have products that are successful, uh, to renovate uh, products and add uh, new products to lines, we've got to be able to create experiences that people love. And that means influencing them or connecting with them in key moments of their life, which is, is why being in context is so important. And uh, so what, what's your background, Dave, on this? Why, I mean, what do you, well, why do you I, think? This I'm is? just looking at the participants that we have here. There's a, a mix of sensory professionals. Mm -hmm. There's some marketers. There's also some product leaders that are, uh, in it. so it's a great mix of people that are here today. Um, and I think uh, this idea, you know, is, so it's not just about the product. You know, right. uh, but the product is one way to provide those experiences to, to build connections to the brand. And, and that's really what we're going to be talking about today. So I, I'm excited about the mix, uh, people, because I think this, this statement uh, means different things to different people. It's, it's a very good point. Very good point. And I think one of the things that I get hung up on when I think about this is that experiences are inherently complex. I mean, if you think about just, say, a food product, and we're going to be using food as an example today, but it's true of true of everything, uh, textiles, personal care products, household goods, uh, you know, over-the-counter medicines, you name it. There's some sort of an unpacking, taking care of the product because it's a packaged good. Most of the time, there's some type of a preparation, even if it's really, really simple, but sometimes can be really complex. Then there's the actual consumption or use or, you know, uh, putting on the wearing, et cetera, so forth. And at the end, there's some disposal or taking off, right, of, of the elements. And so, a, an experience that you're looking to connect with is actually pretty complex. So 
thinking about it from that vantage point, it's important to also think then, okay, well, how can we define what then a, a, a use moment would be? What are the elements that we need to understand in order to address the complexity of, a, of an experience? Or to be competitive in a place because well, the, the point of difference, the point of being competitive may not be just a consumption moment. It may be the unwrapping or the prep or the, yeah. you know, the actual disposal moment. That's as very true. It's very true. You can have a clear point of difference. You could connect with people better in different moments. Certainly with today's sustainability. I mean, I know, you know, the other day I was like, I'm throwing away a package and it had like foam and plastic yeah. and all this stuff. And I was like, what a terrible negative, like the, the procs were great, but at the very end, I'm like negative. Right. So or how many I, times in, over case. the years, Greg, when we've seen um, uh, product differences about cleanup, Oh, yeah. This is not a messy product. Right. This one's cleaner. Right. We Especially remember with lot. some kids testing years ago, you know, things like that, you know. Yeah. But anyway, it's really, yeah. uh, you, ne True. you know, you've got to really understand that complexity. Yeah, for sure. For sure. I agree. And that and it brings you back to what's really important, right, in how we define moments. Um, you know, certainly a lot of people today, you know, focus on just like try to get down to a single metric, like uh, if I'm. Uh, like the product or if I'm satisfied with it. And, mm. and honestly, the, those things are the, that's one of the biggest, I, I think, misses that companies uh, go through or that researchers go through is thinking they can, they can narrow it down quite that tight. Uh, when we think about the moment and defining the moment, there's really three key components to it. There's the context of the occasion and then the internal needs that a person has, and then the external motivators that are driving their actions and behaviors. So the context are things like the location they're in, the activity they're doing, maybe the social setting, time of day, the mood they're in, what types of products and services they have to choose from or competing for their attention at that time, et cetera, so forth. Your internal needs are things like your goals, your ideals, things you believe you ought to do versus ought not to do. Uh, those things are all internal to you and are important to understand. So people have done a lot of need states work. A lot of times this is the component that you're getting at. And then there's the external motivators, like the functional, social, sensorial, psychological aspects of the products that are motivating you or the jobs. If you're in a jobs minded uh, organization, the jobs that a product's supposed to do, right? It's those things that uh, you are being motivated to accomplish in that particular moment. Yeah. If I could add, mm -hmm. you know, these three things are are interrelated. So Ooh, the context beautiful. of the occasion does have impact on the internal needs as well. It oh, yeah. does have impact on the external motivators. Just think of product yeah. cues, you know, and what they signal. Those can be, um, those could be external motivators. You know, I don't want to try that. That's yeah. looks disgusting, you know, you know, uh, but in one context, you know, you may not have that reaction, you know, for one reason or another. Yeah. Yeah, and they're they're completely interrelated to each other, no doubt about it. They they interact. The types of needs that you have push you into different contexts. The types of motivators you have change your choice set, et cetera, so forth. So very much, yeah, you cannot have any if you just try to focus on one of these at a time, you'll you'll miss a little piece of the the importance of how they all interact with each other. Which really brings us back to the, the core element here, which is to really win the use moments, then you've got to be able to impact a person's behavior. You got to be able to connect with them in a way that changes or aligns with something they want to do or need to do. Uh, and, and if that involves a product, so you're talking about a product renovation, you want your product to be chosen in that moment and used in that moment. That means you have to impact something that affects that behavior. Mm -hmm. Right. So, so you're go ahead, yeah, Dave. Yeah. You're, so when when you think about, I mean, for those of you that are not new to um, joining us for for um, webinars or have been working with Insights now, you, this habit flywheel that I'm showing here in the center is something that we show time and time again because it's a it's a framework that we use, but how do you really achieve success? How do you create behavioral 
change, behavioral impact. And uh, in some moment or in, you know, it could be the use, a use moment or it could be other moments as well. But uh, so so uh, looking at this with regard to renovation, I think there's a basic formula for behavioral change that, you can, that first of all, you need to have a product that people will love. OK, and um, and then then that product, once designed and developed, has to um, connect in order to be able to drive this flywheel the, the what i mean is a flywheel metaphor the faster that flywheel goes around the more embedded future habits will be okay so you need to connect your product experience to the brand itself that alignment some products are not well aligned and so it really holds back a product from really being successful in the marketplace but once you have alignment then you can build trust uh, through and build brand relationships by doing what you say you can you're going to do and and saying what you're going to do you know um, and then last with that trust you can actually then it helps foster your marketing messaging uh, so that you can trigger routines and choices to drive the flywheel around so it's a basic formula for thinking about how do you improve uh, your chances for success when you're, when you're considering some sort of brand renovation. Now, yeah, yeah. how many, I'm going to do a short poll here. How many of you um, actually, and uh, the poll is being um, launched right now. How many of you currently conduct product SWATs? Okay. And if you don't know what a SWAT is, then you can say no. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, so, um, OK, letting people connect oh, yeah. in here. Um, long. Huh? OK, yeah, Keep going. Yeah. Still got some Still more got people. It. So, so not quite half of you are, are, uh, or less than half have, have replied, but that's okay. Uh, we'll, but so it's a mix, you know, uh, a little bit yeah. more than half are not um, involved with doing SWATs. And uh, so I'm going to share the results here um, with everybody. So you can see yeah. that, you know, 56 to 44% um, uh, saying no. Now, Here's the interesting thing about this. So close it. Did we close it out? So yeah. I'm not showing. Okay. Back to, um, so uh, if you can go to the next slide. Um, you bet. There we go. So in product in competitive benchmarking, one of the opportunities is to reimagine product benchmarking for doing SWATs. So SWATs is where you bring the product team together and say focusing on um, building a product that people love, one of those four things that I mentioned as key to change behavioral change. And think about uh, create insights that can first help you build on your strengths, to know what your strengths and build on that. Secondly, to figure out how to shore up your weaknesses. Third, find opportunities to create more behavioral change and be more competitive. And fourth, to identify threats so they can be eliminated. Okay, so we're going to be talking about reimagining competitive benchmarking for this purpose. Now, if you think about traditional sort of uh, competitive benchmarking, a lot of it is blinded. That means that you go in and repacking all the competitive set that you're interested in and uh, providing that in a, in a um, situation where it's out of context um, often, um, or you're shipping repack products so that no one knows what the brands are and people may be preparing that in their homes and whatever. Um, and it's very much typically focused on liking. Looking at liking in terms of if it's done completely blind is uh, liking as pleasure. Sensory qualities that that just a sensory experience alone is what people love. Now, and, and usually there's diagnostics like just about right, 
you know, scales, there's penalties. So you can start connecting uh, these two various attributes. Um, you might have a descriptive analysis done on the full set of products so that you can do a drivers of liking analysis and so on. But if you think about it in terms of this broader sort of thinking about um, uh, making a difference, creating behavioral impact through products people love, it miss when you do it this way where products are blinded and focused on liking, you miss key in-moment insights needed for a full product swap. And so uh, just think about the context associated with a brand and how the brand itself does impact the context so that impacts on how people perceive their experiences. And so, so there's, so I want you to just start thinking about that as a, as a starters so that we can further build upon this idea of reimagining competitive benchmarking. Now, in this reimagining competitive benchmarking, if you go to the next slide, Greg, mm -hmm. you know, for SWATs, there's the the idea is to refocus or focus your product teams on this idea of going beyond liking. And so that you can further understand how to create behavioral impact. And I think you could do that in three ways in looking at your insights to figure out what is familiar about your product versus everything else is um, in a competitive set and also what is the twist. So what is the distinction in terms of some benefit that is different about your product? Secondly, think about how there are cues been designed into your products or your competitive products that signal those twists. And third, how does your product or the competitive products create memorable, that is emotionally impactful, uh, so they create memories, lasting memories, and rewarding experiences that people love. So with that mindset, I think you can actually, uh, as we go through a case study that Greg is going to show here in a second, we're going to actually talk through about thinking about how do you get to a competitive SWAT through insights that go beyond liking. So back to you, Greg. All right. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. I, you know, this is, this is an area that I think is, is, is probably uh, one of the areas that people just, they get excited about, am I better than my competition? And one of the things I think is that, that this three sets of going beyond liking statements do is they help you ask the question, well, what information do I need to help me fill out my SWOT, to help me be more competitive, to know, do I have to shift a product? Do I have to change my message? Maybe my product's great and I just need a message change. Maybe my message is fantastic and my product needs a little oomph somewhere. Uh, but where do I need to, to go to compete? When the new people come on market, where are they falling? Where do they mesh in, right? Understanding all those things. If you step back and you say, okay, well, what's their twist? How are they building cues into their products that are signaling the twist? What new cues are hitting the market? How are they creating a memorable experience? Uh, asking about yourself and your competition allows you to really get that full swap put together. So we're gonna be going through a case study on uh, plant-based meats. And I'm gonna be highlighting uh, Beyond Burger uh, simply because I like Beyond Burger. Uh, that's a really <laughs> selfish reason. Uh, but I'm going to be highlighting them for simplicity's sake, right? It's going to be easier to talk, tell the story and for you to see some of the patterns here if we pick a particular brand and stick with it. Now, this research uh, is all done in context, fully branded. So all the data we're going to be sharing today is, is all coming from that fully contexted, fully in-branded uh, uh, situation we like doing the research that way, just like David mentioned, because it gets you really understanding uh, what are all the elements. It's uh, we, We're adding the real life to the full experience. So the data we're getting back is going to match what happens if I renovate or tweak a product. I have to affect those types of scores. Now, there's place and time for doing blind product uh, work or some unbranded work because when you need to get really, really technical on things, that can be really helpful. But when you're looking at a SWOT and you're looking at that benchmarking, 
in context, fully branded is definitely the value proposition you want to go at to get a full understanding. So now traditional, traditional liking based performance. When we look at Beyond Burger and we look at different types of liking scores, like overall liking, appearance liking, et cetera, we see that just looking at liking data alone only gets us a little tiny piece of the puzzle. So you can see there's, you know, beyond is doesn't really stand out overall on liking, but it's got a little bit of an advantage on appearance, a little advantage on texture liking. So you could talk about those things coming back to your SWAT as something that, oh, good, look, I have some strengths. But if that's all you knew about your product, you really would have a very limited amount of information to know, well, what are your weaknesses? What are your threats, right? What are opportunities do you have? Looks like you're doing pretty good. Maybe no opportunities, right? So it gives you a very minor picture of the of the information, if you will, or the real situation. So we're going to talk about metrics that go beyond liking. We're going to talk about uh, implicit associations with benefits that your product is communicating to people about different uh, types of emotional impact scores that you can have different moments of use. Where is your product really strong? What kinds of context does it work or not work in? Uh, we'll still look at some sensory preference segments because we want to reach the highest percentage of the population possible. Uh, product characteristics, drivers of performance, all we're going to have some uh, value in filling out that SWOT and understanding how to go beyond liking, be familiar with a twist. So let's start with benefit associations. And this is really about finding your twist. So if we look at the different types of value propositions that we're trying to position our product against, and if you look at beyond and some of their elements of, of how it's being positioned, we want to know how well are we prefer, performing implicitly, intuitively. Do people, bam, get it right away when they see that our product tastes like meat uh, or, or have experienced uh, that or whether we have interesting flavors or whether we have an appetizing ex uh, appearance, et cetera, so forth. If the language that we're trying to drive home, if we're not performing well on it, then that's an opportunity. If it is something that we're over-indexing on, like tastes like meat and uh, looks like real meat in this case, those things Beyond Burger heavily over-indexes on, that means those are our twists, right? Those are the things that we have over the competition. Whereas maybe some things lower down like sustainability, healthiness, we're as good as other people in the category or the category as a whole, which means that's the familiar place. Well, that might be okay if you want to be as good as everybody else in that space. But if you thought you had a real strong competitive advantage because you had some sustainability edge that nobody else had, and you're not seeing the performance pop here, then now that's a new opportunity to either change your messaging or maybe there's something about the product that's missing that is just not living up to the expectation. So it gives you opportunities to really figure out how to find your familiar, how to find your twist. So Dave, uh, you yeah. see this application in companies, like where where do you see people uh, taking well, real strong advantage of this? Well, I mean, one of the thoughts is like, uh, could be that none of the um, competitive set mm -hmm. uh, or yourself are, um, are, are indexing high on something like sustainable. Right. Okay. Right. Well, there's an opportunity for you. It could That's be true. that there's a segment of shoppers, and we know this is the case, that are looking for products that are positioned as being more sustainable. And uh, you know, one of the problems with plant-based burgers is they really have not been positioned as sustainable. They've been plant, they've been positioned more uh, as as healthy. And um, and so, uh, but anyways, this is an interesting quality that you can look at. That uh, it is an opportunity uh, for yeah. for companies. Very much so, very much so. And um, yeah, we, we actually have a, we have a good question asking, hey, uh, um, the category is kind of bifurcated between people who are looking for products to taste like meat and people who are wanting it to taste more like a veggie burger. Yeah. So how, you know, is segmentation at this level important? Uh, are people and who you recruit, of course, is important. Now, this particular study recruited 
uh, people who used plant-based meats, just to give you a little behind the scenes, this one had uh, basically the only qualification criteria was you have to have used plant-based meats um, or, or plant-based meat like products. So it was going to be a mix of people who are using wanting taste like meat versus people wanting taste like veggie. So how would we, how do you address that, Dave? Well, Greg, I, I think you go back to you because you got some slides okay. that I do get right some. to that. <laughs> so it's a great question. Well, it's so a good question. You're, you're good about question. to answer it. <laughs> okay. Well, segmentation is definitely the key and, and we'll talk about that. Uh, but before we do, I'm going to show you uh, a couple other pieces jumping into that. Uh, number one is is you've got to create a memorable experience. And one of the ways to measure that is with an emotional reaction. So understanding what you perform well on in terms of emotions is going to also really help you understand how to position and market and message your products and brands. Uh, if, you're, if your brand like Beyond, uh, you know, notice that they're like strong on happiness and excited, a little bit on energetic, but relaxed, they're actually below the category average on relaxed. Why is that? It's partly because of the moments they play in. So would you want commercials coming out with showing super relaxed atmospheres? Well, yeah, you're not going to perform as well in those spaces. So stay on your strengths, right? Know, know where you're going to uh, provide yeah. this that is most a, memorable This is experience. a typical emotional profile for yeah. someone who's having a new experience. It's true. You know, yeah. that's positive. Yeah. And so when you have a positive emotional experience, it is creating memories. If you saw that there's no difference, very low yeah. emotional impact, people won't remember it. It's just That's part true. of our how our brains are hardwired. So uh, this this is looking this is this is a really good pattern for uh, looking at uh, beyond. Yeah, I I agree. This is th these types of things. If you're a new introduction, yeah, you definitely want to see those uh, positive scores pop with especially if you get into that surprise space and uniqueness where people don't have an expectation uh next piece is understanding what moments you fit in now this could be because we remember at the beginning we talked about moments have a lot of components to them from you know the location the time the the mood you're in etc so forth so consider that this example of relaxing family dinner at home versus exciting grilling out with friends is just a, a, a tiny uh, snippet of the types of information that you can collect about a moment, uh, the social context, et cetera. So forth. this helps you understand where your strengths and weaknesses are in terms of what moments do you really perform really well in. Now that gives you the opportunity to ask, why do I perform well here? What cues are driving that? And why do I not perform well here? Again, that question of am I, how do I position myself? If I really don't have a product in this case that performs in the relaxing dinner at home, that's an opportunity to build a product that is designed to be more relaxing for more relaxing dinner at home and gets positioned that way. Then you can have products in your, you know, renovate your line to get products positioned at different key moments. Uh, really good opportunity. Yeah, it's a good it's a good example of just the idea of of uh, a product that is uh, more exciting, um, you know, new, exciting is much, you know, is much more shareable. Yeah. And uh, more of the relaxing, which um, uh, beyond indexed uh, lower on, you know, is, you know, also fits uh, more uh, at home. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and, with, and, and maybe, maybe there's less reason in terms of emotional impact to use uh, mm. a new product like that. I don't know. True, true, true. Yeah. Digging deep into the, the qualitative aspects. Now you can, this is, this is really simple. Like in our emotions, we kind of went one dimensional on them in this example, but really because those use experiences are complex, you can actually have a transition oriented. So you can have an exciting preparation experience and consumption experience followed by a beautiful relaxation at the end, right? So you can actually mm. drive a an emotional cycle uh, with certain types of products. Uh, you could 
do the same thing with, uh, you know, like a lot of desserts or like that very first bite is that pow, excitement, first bite, wow. And then you get into the, okay, this is smooth and creamy, relax out at the end. So thinking about mm -hmm. your particular products, you can also have multimodal experiences. And as long as you're understanding what that transition needs to look like, you can design for that transition to take place as well. Yeah, it goes back to the, the whole idea of the complexity of use experiences from first opening up a package to cleaning up or disposal of it, you know, um, has, could have very different emotional impact, very different sort of yeah. um, uh, benefits uh, and, and needs. Right. Very much so. Very much so. All right. And now back to sensory segments. Uh, we kind of, uh, Pop this one maybe a little early with the question, but this is the good piece. Now, not every person has the same preferences. And, uh, you know, as was we were talking about earlier, like some people want the taste like meat. Some people want more of a veggie forward flavor. Somebody, you know, I like a little bit more mushroom forward flavor. Uh, my wife does not like that as much. <laughs> so like different preference profiles, like connect with different people in different ways. One of the ways that you can get at this within the benchmarking space is, is not just only doing like driver's analyses, but also looking at the purchase uh, profiles that people have as well. So you can see the types of products that people are more akin to purchasing in a product and ask yourself, well, what are the characteristics that are, are similar across that profile set? Uh, versus others. So like in this case, we found three different preference segments and you see, can see that uh, those segments really were pretty disparate from each other. Uh, and if, if we're looking at where all these uh, products really fit within the space, understanding, okay, if I need a product line that delivers those profiles, I can maybe need to bring out a product line that's got a little more spice character, a little more, you know, mushroom forward or vegetable forward flavor, maybe something that has a little bit more clean uh, meat character, et cetera, so forth, maybe smoke, right? Depends on which uh, preference group you're going after. What does that do for you? That allows you to create reach within a space because um, in these categories like plant-based meats, there's different use cases and then also layered on top of that different preferences. So having lines that uh, uh, connect with different aspects of those preference segments will help you uh, create greater reach in the marketplace. Right, uh, then product features and characteristics. These are how you're going to understand how do I cue the twist that I own? So if I understand that uh, a key characteristic of, of Beyond is that it tastes more like real meat, one of the questions is what are the sensory characteristics that tell me that that is happening? And how do I know how to keep owning that particular space as I renovate? Uh, how do I know if I'm changing my process, which variables I need to really keep a really tight gris grasp on so that I don't mess up maybe some of my core equity that I've built up as well as I renovate. And so last month we talked about in the moment, in context, uh, adding a new type of question, which was to be the paired question where people can answer, you know, which is stronger? Is it more beef or more spice? Is this more vegetable, more grain? Is this more smoke, more grain? Which one is more? And by doing really simple uh uh, asks like that instead of long scales that you have to teach consumers how to use and that they're not very reliable at using all the time, uh, will give you really good information that allows you to profile and it gives you good understanding of the sensory profile based on the language that the category consumers use to describe the category itself. Okay? So that helps you understand and control then how do you stay unique, how do you stay differentiated. It's also going to help you uncover your weaknesses. So you're going to be able to identify characteristics that maybe if your brand is slowly dropping, uh, losing to competition, uh, you haven't been performing quite as well as you thought you should, helping uh, drive into the cues and understanding which cues are connecting with how you differentiate in the market. You may find that you have cues that are actually pulling you away right, from what is important. 
which brings us to understanding your drivers and the drivers of importance. Mm -hmm. So this is where you need to model uh, that data to figure out, well, how am, uh, or which of those characteristics are more important or less important in delivering some value to the consumer. Now, Dave, you at the beginning, you talked about liking drivers, right? That's mm -hmm. uh, fairly traditional blind liking drivers. Uh, we think that it's really important to go beyond liking. What other variable are should you be modeling against? If I'm beyond, and I, I can look at here, overall satisfaction, right? Full experience satisfaction. But I can also model against things like, tastes like real meat, right? And I can identify then what are those sensory characteristics that are, uh, driving it positively and negatively to understand what are the things I need to amplify and what are the things I need to minimize in order to improve my ex sensory experience so that I better deliver that implicit benefit. Yeah. Say, so, you know, for instance, you can do the same with not just your product, but if you if you have designed your research, you have enough um, uh, uh, data, um, enough uh, for competitive products in there, you can then look to see how your competitors are, uh, what the drivers are um, and things that they index high and you index low on, as an example, right. uh, to look for um, ways that you could potentially improve your position in the market against those specific competitors. So there's all sorts of opportunities when you do competitive benchmarking to really look at uh, these sort of drivers of performance when you can focus on at, uh, various qualities that go beyond liking. Right, very much so, very much so. All right, so those metrics, I think are all come together to help you really understand elements to give you a good SWOT, right? You can identify your clear strengths, you can identify key weaknesses that you may have, opportunities, places where there where um, there's an, uh, maybe you're not performing as well as you thought you could have in terms of what you have a strength on that you're not capitalizing on, as well as threats, where competitors are coming in, where new uh, players to your category are take, gonna be taking your share, et cetera, so forth, or maybe have the potential to take your share, maybe even if they're not capitalizing on it. Mm -hmm. Now, we, I talked with lots of people over the, the last month since uh, last month's webinar, and I was asking everybody what their bigger challenges are when it came to anything related to benchmarking, whether you called it category reviews, benchmarking, if you may have other names for it. But really, it came down to, to four different things. Number one, it's too slow. It's too, ex two, it's too expensive. Three, it's too complex. Those all go together, right? Complexity creates expense, also slows it down. And then at the end, it's like, I'm not really learning a lot new. I, at least I don't think I'm learning a lot new. And when I ask them what data they're using, well, most of the time it's like, well, we really haven't really thought about changing what we used to do in the past. So I think there's huge opportunities. But when I hear that they're too slow, too expensive, too complex, also makes me ask, well, how often are you doing the work? And most of the time, the people that are saying, hey, it's really complex, they're like, yeah, every couple, three years, uh, maybe even longer. And I find that to be a, a little bit scary because <laughs> a lot of product categories move really fast. Think about plant-based burgers and how fast that category was moving, how many introductions are coming in all the time. If you're just doing benchmarking like as one big study uh, every several years, yeah, you're, you just don't have the most current knowledge to be the most competitive you can be. So your SWAT's not going to be that accurate. Uh, so what I would say is you want to start your your benchmarking uh, right away, right? You need to understand your competition. So it doesn't really matter what stage you're in, in terms of like, hey, my line extension is poorly performing. Do I go right now or do I go later, et cetera? So you need to know where you're at now. And unless you are in a situation where you just finished everything and you have all the data you need, you really should be in a situation where you're trying to find a way to create an ongoing rhythm where you're adding new products to the set as they come along, et cetera, so forth, which is one of the reasons why doing this fully branded in context improves and makes this a lot easier to accomplish because you don't have to set up this huge 
blinded, uh, complex piece of research, uh, you can just have people go out and test the next new product and add that to the database. And if you know a competitor has changed something or changed their formula, just go get the new read and off you go. So you don't have to keep um, uh, this mindset of big, bold, giant studies, which made us question, what are some ways to reinvent like the process of doing the research? So we sat down, we thought through the, the process here, and here's some of the ways that we think uh, will help you think about if I want to go faster, keep my costs down versus if I need more control, uh, depending on the product you have and the situation you are in, you may want one over the other. So if you're wanting to go really fast, low cost, and you don't really need the control uh, over the product, i.e. you can just let the product consumers use it as they would, if you will, in real life, you can actually just recruit people who already have your product or the products that you're going after, already have them in home, provide them with a survey, and as they go to use that product next, have them provide an evaluation. So it's not really that much different than just conducting a survey because the products are already there. Keeps your cost down, keeps your uh, um, complexity of getting product to people down. So you've got a really quick, efficient way uh, to go. That's a really a nice approach also when you're working with products where maybe you have legal issues about what they can and can't use. Uh, Over-the-counter medicines would be a, a really simple example here where having the product something they already purchased, already have used, right? Uh, you're not giving them something that, you know, you know, the, not really sure how they might react to it, et cetera, and so forth. So you've got some good opportunities on, on that bottom end. The next layer up is getting them to go to the store and buy the product themselves. And, and this, of course, eliminates a lot of that, well, I got to ship product to people. I got to get, get the product in their hand. As long as you're recruiting people that you know have access to those products in store, they can go make the purchase themselves and they can verify it now, right? With uh, visual identity, you know, scoring, et cetera, so forth. So you've got all, all the pieces and parts you need technologically to make this happen. But you can also add into your benchmarking the aspect of the in-store experience and the selection process. So remember when Dave was showing mm -hmm. that habit flywheel, you're adding one more element to the to the process because you're getting to add in uh, part of that shopping experience and you could right. actually benchmark yourself a little bit on that shopping journey as well, All right? Uh, then you, of course, have things that are probably more common that people probably grew up or probably are doing mostly today, which is shipping products to people's homes. It's more like a, a classic study, a home use test that uh, is probably one of the more popular, or having people shipping products to a central location of some sort, having that central location, maybe repack, reorganize product, get them ready in a kit for a person to pick up, uh, and then have them pick up that kit and then take it home and use it. So as you go through those things, you get more expensive because there's more people involved, more complexity involved, uh, more product cost involved, uh, but you gain a little bit more control if you need that for your particular product. All right, so this this all lends itself very well to so, uh, fully branded and getting yeah. in the moment, right? And yeah, which is so, a really important part. Yeah, just add one thing. I mean, if you're um, strapped for time, mm -hmm. Oh. and 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 budget you could still get the richness of uh by going all the way here to the left you can get uh it just you can fulfill this you can have because if you're looking at the key uh competitive set products you're going to we'll be able to find um you know consumers that had those products in their home today or could easily go out and pick them up. Um, and which is a very low cost, very fast way to do things and can get you the richness of, of the information and the insights needed to do full product swats. So it's, yeah. um, it's uh, but sometimes you need the more control. And uh, yeah. you, you know, uh, when you do a survey format, you may need to get small N on some products that uh, may not be, you know, big players, but could be future players. Well, right. you know, you may want to, uh, that may force you a little bit more to the right in tunes of your design. 
True, true. And you can mix and match a little bit here. That's the other beautiful thing about this. So like the the Beyond study that we shared today, we had people, we recruited people who already had product and home, had them evaluate those. And then we shipped them uh, the Beyond product because we needed, we really wanted to control the uh, the, the the production date uh, for that particular product. Uh, and right. when we were, when we were shipping that, so we actually were really careful to pick a very specific date and then get that shipped to them uh, in a, you know, in a nicely temperature controlled way. So it was like a, you can mix and match where you need that control and where you're willing to give it up as an example. All right. So all of that information is really good, but now you got to get it, take, take action on it. Right. And yeah, you actually got to make yeah. it happen in, in house. Yeah. So SWAT, you know, I think is really important. Um, uh, you know, so let's just advance. Um, I want to make a couple. So you could take all this information and you can make it easily accessible um, to a whole team of people. You can actually create what if models, and we've done this uh, through through some some techniques that we have, so people can play with the results um, and learn from the, the results uh, when you have underlying models. So you can be a little more predictive. You can look at you know slice and dice your data and all that. You could do those things, but the main thing is to get the whole project team together and to look at information in ways that is easily understood. So you can, ev everyone who has a different on the project, a product team has a different perspective um, concern on either marketing or packaging or, or product itself um, or, or the research insights or whatever, um, all gonna have a different perspective on this. And I think it, it, the idea is bringing teams together so that you can actually have a really good SWOT. So next slide. So again, looking at SWOT, SWOT uh, sort of um, taking this content, you can actually build on your strengths so that you, you actually can say, okay, this is the ways that I can maybe improve my product by um, building cues that signal twists in ways that uh, maybe I'm, I'm currently um, indexing high and I could potentially index even higher to create more um, competitiveness. Or perhaps there's an opportunity to add a new twist, maybe targeting a new segment of, of um of consumers or that have different preferences so that you can have um, uh, through a product line, have more opportunities to have greater reach in, uh, across a whole category um, of users. And then, or you can shore up weaknesses, you know, by perhaps if you discover through brand promise or our marketing messaging um, and delivery, if you're not um, aligned, then that's a weakness you can shore up by identifying what those issues are. And last, to look at products that are coming on that could are potential, um, identify them as potential threats, um, I think it could be so important uh, to get ahead of the curve before they actually do cut into your, um, in, into your, um, revenue and, and, and your, your uh, potential uh, percentage of, of share of a, of a specific category. So, so I think yeah. it's really important to think and, and think backwards. Think, okay, these are the types of, um, in a SWOT, what I want to achieve and then work backwards. That will help you identify what product set is important. You know, whether it's going to be products that are, um, existing um you know that that are part of my line uh which ones do i know i'm competing against you know or to really identify products that are not working in the marketplace i think you need a mix and it but it all depends on what your objectives are um from the outcome of a swat yeah for sure and and that's why things like you can see blind branded right um, we're if you're not doing this in context, fully branded, you're not going to really understand where those weaknesses are from market messaging to brand per product performance, et cetera, so forth. So there's a lot of value in getting uh, fully in context when you're right. building out your SWAT, right, which, right. which really takes us to the end, right? Yep. And getting ourselves activated for doing those product SWATs, being able to go beyond liking, being familiar, but having your unique twist that you really own to keep that 
product really memorable for people and having the cues and knowing the cues that you have to own and protect that's going to signal that value that you yeah. give to people. I was thinking about going back to our poll, you know, how oh, yeah. uh, 60% of uh, at least those that are, I mean, it's like me, a third of people that respond, but of that group that did respond, 60% uh, said they really uh, don't get involved with product swaps. Now, I know for for sure that the product leaders and marketers that are on mm -hmm. those people, because that's a business sort of of, of sort of approach, uh, standard approach to really getting more strategic. Um, maybe some sensory professionals that said no are probably you know may have said no. Maybe it's because they're you know not thinking about the opportunity to go beyond liking because doing this research, just designing it slightly different is not a major cost, especially when you can uh, look at uh, looking at product that is in market or yeah. in home already True. and have people pick them up um, or use what's currently in their pantry or, or currently um, in their bathroom or for a personal care product or whatever. You know, so the opportunities are to go beyond liking yeah to add more value to your research, bring in your marketers, bring in uh, your stakeholders, create these product swats, you know, so that you can figure out, you know, what, what is your twist, you know, and how to, uh, how to improve by designing cues into products that signal those twists, how to create memorably, emotionally impacting, um, rewarding experiences that people love. Yeah, no doubt. Very well, very well said. So now we've got uh, an opportunity for everybody to ask questions. We've already answered several that uh, came through. Thank you very much for, for dropping those. More questions uh, available here. And while people are typing questions, Dave, you you made a comment that you know it really doesn't add a whole lot of cost or uh, to to go the fully branded in context route, I would argue it actually takes away cost. Uh, most of the time we see the cost of doing fully branded in context work is actually less expensive than the cost of getting all these products pre-prepped, rebrand or you know, debranded if you right. if you have to do that, repacked three digit, you know, all the all the components that you you know the the cost of taking away context is uh, is high because you're doing something that's that's less common, right? The most common scenario we have is fully branded in context. That's what people do it day in and day out. So it's, uh, I would say certainly I, from my perspective anyway, I've seen that cost actually is traditionally less when you go into context with fully branded products, which gives you a lot more degrees of freedom. That means you, if you have a fixed budget, you can add more products, you can add more people, you can look at more segments, you can put more data into your uh, portfolio as yeah. well, get more value. Depends on your value. objectives and just totally working backwards true. from those, totally you know. True. And, uh, you know, there's a question here um, about uh, getting this deck. Um, oh, yeah. You know, this, this is recorded. And so this recording will be available with all these slides and everything um, included um, here uh, in the next couple of days, and you'll be um, allowed to. So anyone who registers, go through the registration, can watch this. Uh, so it's very easy to get this content. But there's one. We'll go one thing. We've created created a um, a a a paper that summarizes a lot of what we've um, gone through today. And uh, we can we'll send out that a link so you can download that paper uh, for anybody who wants that. And so we're going to do that as part of our follow up. Um, yeah. And another question here is, is this this, um, you know, Greg, you can address this, I'm sure, about yeah. you know, well, different industries, you know. Yeah, one more. I'll follow on before I get to that. Follow on with getting the deck. Also, you know, if you need us to give a presentation to your internal team, or you want us to talk about that, uh, just this morning I did a lunch and learn of webinar we gave, you know, several months back because, you know, there was a whole bunch of people that needed to hear it and it was the right time for them. Uh, so absolutely, just reach out. We're glad to provide the uh, a, a revisit, if you will, or a refocused. Uh, uh, conversation with you. Right. All right. So next, uh, specific industries or categories that this um, uh, approach has the most impact on. Boy, um, I don't know that there, I mean, we worked in consumer packaged goods uh, day in and day out. And so uh, anything from food and beverage, personal care, household care products, anything that is really a packaged good 
that is we've we've seen this to be extremely powerful in that particular area. Where I would say this has been the most powerful is in that renovation space where where you know a, a benchmark is good when you're trying to say if you're trying to enter a brand new category. Uh, but usually it's even more valuable for you to continually have the most up-to-date information on a place where you're already playing. So I would certainly say that's an important piece of it. Uh, anytime you have a competitive, a highly competitive space, uh, this is really good. If you're in a situation where you actually have many brands going after the same category, this becomes incredibly valuable because then you can put strategies together to either target different moments with different brands or different preference groups with different brands, et cetera, so forth. So you have a several strategic opportunities to align multiple brands across a, a category space. So I would say uh, certainly those two situations, this becomes that much more valuable. Um, if you're constantly trying to be the competitor, if you're a store brand, always wanting to make sure where am I at, where, how am I doing within my space? Am I good enough? Uh, just doing liking studies is, uh, is probably a little bit of a fool's errand. You got to really understand what your brand is bringing to the equation in that uh, particular space. And uh, if all you want to do is compete on price, okay, you might not need very much. But if you're actually trying to drive brand value with your store brands, then uh, you need to take a look at what those are and go more into those implicit benefit component pieces that are going to get you beyond it. Great. Okay. We're about out of time. All right. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, any, uh, any others that you saw on here that we didn't address or... I, I think yeah oh doing branded and blind is a question yeah there is a time and a place for branded and blind it's not like blind is bad data right it's a, there's a reason that we do it as an industry so understanding brian bland brian branded and blind certainly lets you see a little bit of how the brand changes the context and expectations for people and therefore changes how they physically perceive something so certainly having both is valuable but you always have to keep in mind that no consumer is ever going to buy your product blind and taste it blind. <laughs> They're always in yeah. some context with some brand. You can happening. take a modeling approach. I mean, oh, there, that's you, good point. If, you have, yeah. if you have money to spend on both, great. You know, that's, that's one approach. Uh, but to be a little more efficient in one piece of research is if you could understand the value, the, that, that a, um, you know, that the, the brand itself in its meaning and there's there's some other techniques that you can actually do that you can actually look then at you know the impact of that how that's contributing to things like choice very much true very true very true and yeah adding choice metrics to a piece of research like this yep. uh, certainly very valuable add-on as well yeah yep well, fantastic. Thank you very much, everybody, for uh, listening in today and uh, looking forward to uh, seeing people at uh, future events. If you have any questions, uh, certainly feel free to reach out, uh, connect with us. We've got uh, you've got our information probably readily handle handy Good. since you thanks, signed up. Thanks, thanks for the, the claps. So thank you very much, everybody. Yeah, I really appreciate your time appreciate today. It. Good All questions. Right. Bye, everybody. All right. Bye bye.